afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Um, hope everybody received their pizzas. And I'm going to turn it over to Joe Clark right now, who will be presenting for this webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. And good afternoon, those of you that are on the webinar. We're going to give it probably one or two more minutes here while we're getting started, just as people are rolling in. And I apologize in advance for those of you that hear the a little bit of congestion in my voice. I'm definitely congested this morning. That pollen and whatnot flying through the air makes it delightful to listen to my voice over the phone. So apologies for that, but we'll give it a minute or two, and then we'll get started. Okay, guys, we are going to go ahead and get started. So again, thank you guys all for being here. I hope you guys uh, got pizza and are somewhere comfortable. And uh, just wanted to start by overviewing a little bit about myself, but who's the guy on the other end of the phone? So tiny bit about me. My name is Joe Clark. I'm out of the Cleveland area, and I'm a principal architect at Advisex. Right now I'm a double VCDX, and I've been focused on EUC and software-defined data center engineering for the past five or six years. And prior to that, I worked in-house in the financial and healthcare sectors in Northeast Ohio. Um, I have, I guess, lots of certs and lots of children. And the interesting part about me is that I got lots of certs while I had lots of children. So, you know, that's uh, it takes a lot of guts to do that, I guess. So that's, that's a tiny bit about me. All right, so moving forward. When we're, I just wanted to start off the conversation sort of by saying, with a lot of solution vendors out there today, we see a lot of this. We see a lot of folks that will come into a room of customers and say, you know what, I have this one thing for sale and it's great. And aren't you interested in it? Look how, look how great it is. And it's, and it's a canvas, right? When we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about you know, a canvas, what, what, what's being held up, what's being presented. But most of the time from a customer perspective, if thinking to yourself, okay, well, well, I really want art. And, and that was my thought when I was a customer. I wanted someone to come in and say, look, I don't really care necessarily about, you know, sure, I care about the details of the specifics of whatever it is you're doing, but I would rather that you understand what it is I'm trying to accomplish with the business and how you can help me with that. So the idea here that you want someone to under see from a solution standpoint and not from a product standpoint is, is, pretty, is pretty clutch and pretty important. So I also wanted to start off, you know, the title of this talk is about hyperconverged infrastructure. So I wanted to start off by talking about converged infrastructure in general. Uh, we This word gets thrown around a lot, and I wanted to say the difference between converged and hyperconverged and what does it actually mean. You know, we got Diego Montoya there. I do not think it means what you think it means. So let's break it down. So if we look at a traditional infrastructure, typically you'll start with something like backup and disaster recovery, some sort of tape or, uh, virtual tape library. Some kind of block storage. You'll have a SAN which connects those. You'll also have compute, you know, your CPUs and memory, and you have some sort of network to end up tying that together. And then oftentimes you'll have some sort of a NAS unit or a file or file unit off to the side. This is typically in a traditional infrastructure configured independently 
and managed independently. So you buy a SAN, you buy block storage, you buy a compute, you buy all these things independently of each other. Also, they're all typically configured on site, more often than not, by the administrators that are local inside of the facility. Now, the difference between traditional and converged, if we look at it, is with converged, oftentimes we see you know the, the block storage and file storage come together. Sometimes it remains separate and backup and DR are typically in an appliance or some sort of a storage solution. There's some sort of a SAN connecting it together, compute, and network on top of that. So it's actually very, very similar to what we sort of just laid out. The difference here is that they are purchased together and independently managed. And the one sort of thing that really sets us apart is OEM validation sort of across that stack, saying, look, we've done our due diligence and we've sort of stamped and certified that these components will work together on these levels of code. One of the main differences is, where is it configured? No, it's no longer configured on-site after installation. They just moved it to the front. It is configured off-site prior to installation. And those are sort of the two key points and difference between traditional converters is that it's convert is typically configured ahead of time and shows up pre-configured with OEM validation. Now, when we look at hyperconverged, that changes it even a little bit more. So with hyperconverged, we basically put the disk back inside of the boxes and said, you know what, we can basically present each storage node as a function of the compute nodes, and we can enable software services which can deliver backup and recovery file services and block storage, and basically have compute nodes that also serve as storage nodes simultaneously. And typically on top of those nodes, there's production and management network that's involved. Now these are typically the network and compute are purchased independently and managed independently. And those are typically configured on site. And this is when we're looking at just hyperconverged. So if you were just setting up a cluster or something like that, that's all you would be looking at. So the difference here again, that we're putting the smart sort of into software on um, what we would call commodity hardware, rather than saying we're going to have separate functions for different boxes that are in the racks in our data centers. So when we go and take the hyperconverged sort of to the next level, we look at saying, okay, if we have multiple hyperconverged appliances or blocks that we're using, and we have a network layer on top of that, what if we had an infrastructure manager that could be responsible for the bring up the imaging and the compute file block storage for the entire infrastructure? And that's sort of the hyperconverged rack scale architecture that we end up seeing. This is managed uniformly and typically purchased together. It can be purchased separately, though. It can be configured either on-site or off-site, depending on which offering you would be interested in purchasing or implementing. So let's talk about why hyperconverged has sort of got a lot of traction. And everybody that's ever managed an infrastructure will sort of be nodding their heads along to the build out of this slide, which is that we've got CPU, memory, disk, and network, basically as a part of every single implementation you've probably done. If we look at the amount of resource that you end up spending, say you have a project, you're gonna say, all right, let's stand up new resource for this project, you know, XYZ, here we go, project XYZ. We're gonna consume some of our resources. There we go, we're consuming some. And we continue to grow, new initiatives come up, everything else, and we begin to use infrastructure more and more, and something will end up getting used more than one of the others. Oftentimes it's storage, sometimes it's compute, sometimes it's network, in this illustration it's storage. So what happens next? We do some sort of a storage expand. Let's expand it out. Let's say, all right, time to expand out that storage. Let's get more disk, let's get more trays, let's do whatever we have to do to increase capacity or throughput and performance and make that work. Cool. Now we've done an expand there. Well, now we have to expand CPU and memory as well. Um, <clears throat> simply because now that we've expanded storage, oftentimes CPU and memory end up filling up what's next. So what happens next? All right, let's buy more compute. Let's expand that out. And then what happens again? storage ends up redlining again, and we end up having, playing this game where it's like we're continually piecemealing and adding different pieces of infrastructure a piece at a time, and eventually you reach a point where you cannot scale one of these any further. You, you run out of clusters, you run out of disk limits for arrays, and you end up having to do a fork, forklift upgrade, and that's typically in year you know, two and a half to three, uh, or year two, on a depreciation cycle where some companies target three to five years. So what we end up seeing some of those, you know, headaches is multiple management planes for compute, for storage, for network. That you know, there's there's multiple different teams that end up having to manage that. 
the expand effort for each of these is pretty significant to rack and stack, to ensure you're doing this in a maintenance window, to um, understanding the capabilities from availability standpoint, all that. The spend timing is very important as well because oftentimes you might run out of capacity at a time that is inopportune and budget schedules are not ready. So the inability to predictably spend when you need to upgrade is another problem with that. Uh, going along with the management planes, department silos is another function of just simply having multiple management planes. Oftentimes, if you're in your tier three of a storage uh, project or implementation, your option is to either expand it or forklift it or change it. And those are the three options that you have. And so there's there's a little bit of feel of some, of some lock-in, otherwise you're going to undergo a pretty big migration effort. You also have to worry about interoperability between all these components individually. You're, you're yourself concerning yourself with the versions of code that's running out of each of these to ensure that you have an optimal and high-performing experience. And then when it's time to retire or migrate, you have to ensure that you can migrate successfully, that you're provided with sort of a transition path from one solution to another one. So as we talk about hyperconvergent infrastructure, it's important for us to understand that it is not a product. It's an architecture. And this is how Advisix views it, that it is an architecture choice to say, we would prefer to put the disk back in the server for this particular application of technology. And what problems do we see it solving when this is an option? We see it easing the effort on expand up and expand out. So you can scale up, you can scale out by adding more nodes, or you can scale up by adding more additional resources into the nodes. We see it providing a better time to value on capital expenses. Simply put, you can get it racked and stacked and getting you money back from using it faster. We see an overall reduction of total cost of ownership simply because with one storage stack or um, a storage stack that is closer to the compute, it is oftentimes a little bit more cost effective than having a purpose-built storage unit. Businesses that are choosing uh, from any supported commodity x86 hardware find that they don't experience a hardware vendor lock-in where they say we have to buy this kind of a server because you know that's that's what it is. You know we care more about CPU and disk capacities than anything else. We can have, with some of the offerings, we can opt for automatic OEM validation of drivers and firmware, which is really fantastic because, you know, there, while some folks will say that they can do that, a lot of them, a lot of the offerings out there today really simply cannot and is not uh, uh, a viable solution. When we look at the centralization of the virtualization and storage management planes, that is a huge win for a lot of people. Basically saying, hey, we can get things done faster simply by ensuring that we're managing our storage and virtualization technologies together. A lot of times, this is a huge one. I, I hammer on this all the time when I'm architecting solutions for customers, which is simplifying the architecture. Anywhere you can provide simplicity is a win in your implementation. And that is because as you look to protect it, as you look to replicate it, it's going to get complex quickly. And the, the simpler you can have a solution be right out of the gate, the better for everyone. Another super plus is that you can meet storage availability requirements based on policy without necessarily having to do a bunch of disk juggling. Uh, so if you've ever been a part of like, you know, a disk pool rebalance or something like that to ensure that you can meet availability or performance requirements, that's all done with policy now with software-defined storage. And then finally, we can enhance flexibility, you know, with uh, data protection by leveraging software-based data protection solutions rather than using data protection solutions that are coupled with and require external separate hardware. So if we are going to say hyperconverged is not a product, you know, there's always sort of one snarky guy out there that's going to say, okay, yeah, it's uh, not a product then, Joe. So how exactly do we run this without servers and storage? How do, how do we run it? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I, I get it. Okay, let's, let's talk through that. You, you will need servers and storage to, to run hyperconverged infrastructure. No secret there. So an advisor said, we're talking about how do we build this. We think about it like this. You could build hyperconverged infrastructure with Lego bricks. So you could build it with, you know, supported components that are supported by the software-defined storage technology that are sort of piecemealed and say you want, you know, a particular flavor of server and a particular flavor of disk and HBA. You can individually choose those and assemble them and make it work as long as they're all supported in agreement by the vendor. You can also sort of take an approach where you say, well, you know what, that, you know, that sounds like it's a lot of uh, work to do that. I would rather build with Duplos where there's less choices to make. It's like, do I want, you know, 
the half duplo or the full duplo and what color do I want? Okay, cool, go. And then the last two options are basically like duplo sets. It's basically saying, hey, I would like to leverage multiple sets of duplos to construct a repeatable infrastructure that scales rapidly without much worry of the future. And so when we look at that, how does that compare to a hyperconverged infrastructure discussion? Thus, on the left is build your own. The idea here is that it's saying we can construct a hyperconverged infrastructure using software technologies like either VMware's Virtual Sun, EMC Scale I.O., or HP Store Virtual, where we're simply choosing supported components. We can also build from ready nodes, and a ready node is a node that is basically manufactured to spec with supported components for whatever the software-defined technology is. And they're ready to go and typically completely populated with disk, which makes them a little bit more expensive than build your own, but it also makes them more validated and ready to go. We can also leverage a validated SDDC design philosophy with a sort of Duplo set mentality. And this is where saying, well, we're gonna use Duplo blocks in an automated fashion to build an infrastructure that includes both networking, uh, compute, and storage together. And then, on the third, and then on the fourth column there, we've got engineered systems, which is engineered systems are solutions that are a little bit more constrained by nature and that is simply because they are leveraging typically a subset or a smaller set of uh, oftentimes those, those ready nodes. Um, and what we end up seeing there is less flexibility. So as, when we look at this from a cost perspective to left, it's much cheaper than on the right. And the simple reason behind that is the smarts that go into the software. The smarts that go into the software for engineered solutions require more money to be put into research and development to develop feature sets. It's very simple. Um, and there's, there's money that goes into saying, hey, if you want, you know, one-click upgrades, there's money that goes into the engineering behind one-click upgrades, which you end up having to pay for, rather than if you do it yourself, you're saying, hey, I'm going to own most of that, and I'm going to take, you know, the responsibility for any of that. From a similar standpoint, if we look at flexibility, we see that on the left-hand side, it's extremely flexible to build your own, and some of the engineered solutions are constrained by nature. And this is simply from the design standpoint of the number of variables that engineered solutions can, you know, withstand. If we said we have to support an engineered solution for every type of hardware that exists out there today, obviously that, that's not a very wise model. There has to be some give and take, which is why there's difference in flexibility. For example, if you wanted, you know, a bunch of fax cards and different things inside of, you know, your hosts or, you know, a ton of different storage connectivity to be cabled in with whatever your hyperconverged solution is. It might be smarter to do a build your own or a validated or a validated bundle uh, with built out of ready nodes simply because you can say, all right, well, uh, I know that I'm going to have more flexibility in the end state configuration. Whereas with some of the engineered solutions, you wouldn't just be able to pop the lid and throw whatever cards you want inside of it. So understanding what it is you're trying to accomplish and what your requirements are are extremely important. So I want to talk about what we're going to be talking about with the rest of today's presentation. We're going to be talking about a lot of those four different things. We've got sort of that build your own, the bundles, and validated SDDC and engineered systems. And part of what we're going to end up talking about today is going to be the VMware Virtual SAN product. We're going to be talking about VMware Cloud Foundation. We're going to be talking about VxRail. And we're going to be talking about VxRack SDDC. And those are all based off of uh, predominantly VMware technologies, and that's going to be the focus for today's presentation. So let's start off by talking about VMware Virtual SAN. So for those of you who aren't aware of what VMware Virtual SAN is, it is a native software-defined storage platform to the vSphere architecture, which means you plug in disk locally to the servers, you share them amongst the servers sort of in a pooled fashion. Uh, making one shared data center or data store that is shared amongst members of a cluster. And it is managed through per VM storage policies, which basically says if we want to control, you know, the amount of resiliency that we would like to apply to a particular virtual machine, we can do that with VMware Virtual SAN. <clears throat> and part of the reason we end up seeing a lot of customers ending up obtaining Virtual SAN is simply because a lot of it's, it's the same tools with no new skills required necessarily. There's a, some additional things in the vCenter UI we have to deal with, but it's not the difference between, say, a third-party storage array 
and understanding how to zone it, cable it, set all that up, and then provision storage out, and then scan storage, and saying, hey, this is basically putting the software-defined storage stack under VMware's umbrella. Uh, it's a proven choice of third-party ecosystems, so you can basically get pretty much any, you know, you can either do the build your own or the ready nodes or the validated software-defined data center. You can grow into the VMware CDC model. Um, and finally, you can protect existing storage investments, right? If we look at what we've got over here, we've got that, you know, optional SAN NAS sitting right there, which is basically sort of that call out saying, you know what, if we have some additional storage components that we need to integrate with that we are not ready to throw off the truck just yet, then that's then that is perfectly acceptable for leveraging with vSAN. One of the differences between vSAN and perhaps some of the competitors is that vSAN is embedded directly into vSphere, which provides a really simple I.O. efficient path where the kernel modules inside of ESXi are actually performing the storage function rather than, say, some sort of a control virtual machine which is associated with disks and disk groups that are then reshared out amongst the existing members of the cluster. So with this, we end up seeing more VMs per host, uh, more consistent performance, and pretty minimal host and CPU and I.O. overhead. From an architecture perspective, there's flash in every single vSAN configuration that exists. There is a caching tier and there's a data persistence tier, regardless of whether you opt for the hybrid solution or the all flash solution, which provides typically better I.O. with lower latency. So when we're looking at the caching and data tier, the way that that works is that in the cache tier for hybrid configuration, We've sort of got this idea where 30% of those of that cache tier is reserved for writes, and in hybrid, 70% of it is reserved for a read cache. And what that means is, as a write would come into that uh, into that cache, it's going to hit the cache every single time, and eventually be destaged from cache to persistent disk in one megabyte chunks. And when there's a read cache miss, that gets promoted back up and sits in sort of that, you know, 70% of this is sort of that write cache and this is that read cache. We've got 70% of the cache disk that's going to be leveraged for read caches. And it's a little bit different with the all-flash technology because reads are so readily available from an all-flash perspective on SSDs, all 100% of the cache tier in an all-flash solution is reserved for the write-back buffer. And we have all reads serviced directly from SSD in the capacity tier. The way that virtual SAN is designed is we have this concept of disk groups, where in each disk group we have at least one caching device, and we have a, a number of, or you know, up to seven capacity devices in a single disk group. And we can have up to five disk groups per host, and I think now we're up to 48 terabytes total in a single node with virtual SAM. And it's impressive to say that uh, the latest version is build number 6.6, and there's been a, a ton of new performance improvements that have come out with that, and it's been the most featureless re release that I've seen since the inception of the product. And one of those features is this concept of degraded device handling enhancements, where if we're using the smart technology, which, you know, smart is basically the health counters in the drives. We can sort of proactively begin to migrate data away from drives that are beginning to fail or show evidence of where and mark those devices automatically as absent. So one of the questions that I get all the time is, hey, well, on that, on that topic of failure, how does virtual SAN handle failure? So let's walk through this diagram and sort of understand what it is. At Advisix, we recommend if you're leveraging vSAN that you do not start with a configuration that is lower than four nodes. We would say for the typical virtual SAN configuration, four nodes is the minimum. You can do a two node for a remote office, but that still requires the third node that is a witness that, that exists further out. And the reason for that is, is if we want to provide any sort of resiliency whatsoever, we need to be able to serve, uh, to serve up a witness component and two copies of the data for each virtual machine. So what were to happen if we were to lose one of the disks, say, in this disk group on ESXiO3? If we were to lose one of those disks that exists here, that disk will be marked as degraded. And immediately upon failure, that VMDK will be rebuilt on a surviving 
host or disk group in a different node so that we can ensure that we can tolerate a failure of another host. Now, if we were to experience a failure of an entire host, this failure state is called absent. And what happens when we have an absent configuration is there is this 60 minute wait period time because we are sort of saying, okay, well, let's, let's hold on before we rebuild and relocate all of the disks that exist on this host from one node to another one so that we can get out of a degraded state and back into a normal state. Let's wait 60 minutes and see if that comes back. And this is a configurable parameter. So on the 60 minute timer, that rebuild will take place. And from the surviving components, we will rebuild the existing, uh, we will rebuild the copies of the VMBKs that were lost from an absent host. So we end up seeing this, and we talked about the difference between hyperconverged and sort of, you know, the traditional and converged. And this is one of the things that I oftentimes whiteboard out, which is the concept of when we have to do an acquisition of traditional storage, some sort of an array, some sort of something, we've got this idea where we're doing this high stepping outlay of cash, you know, maybe once per year. So we've got sort of like year one, year two, year three, where we're sort of stepping up and saying, okay, you know, we, we've, we've got to buy and expand each time here. Whereas if we leverage hyperconverged, we can say, all right, if we begin to run out, we can more closely align those outlays of cash with the demands of the business. So if we know that we have a couple projects coming up, that we can expand that sort of on demand rather than saying, oh, okay, we, we need to do a major effort to lift our storage. It's not as big of a deal as it was before, perhaps. And we end up seeing a real drop in cost of ownership simply because the amount of ports total that we end up needing drops because if we don't need a SAN as well as a production network, and, and in fact, the network is the SAN, uh, we end up saving from a network perspective, and we also end up seeing a drop cost from a disk perspective as well. And from an operations standpoint, we see administrative time go down pretty significantly. You know, the idea that we can have one tool, one team is nice. Uh, in reality, more often than not, you still end up, you know, participating with members of a team because there is still uh, design that design that has to go into virtual SAM and you know but the administrative time is really what ends up getting dropped to say hey to scale out storage to reconfigure to recover from a failure those are all things that more people can jump in on and have you know sort of that co-trained idea with and if we look at you know what are the three most important things that help pe people or people said hey why did you pick virtual SAM why did you do it the the three top choices you know uh, chosen by customers, you know, 220 that were surveyed, was, hey, it integrated natively with vSphere. So that was an easy choice. It was fast and easy to deploy, and it was cheap. And, uh, and the, me being a mobility expert as well, a lot of the customers I end up with are leveraging this for virtual desktop infrastructures where the total cost of ownership has to be low, and storage can oftentimes for virtual desktop be sort of an afterthought. Okay, so let's that's that's virtual SAN. So let's let's get through uh, VxRail next, and then VMware Cloud Foundation and VxRack. So VxRail is an implementation of vSAN that is brought by Dell EMC. It's one of those engineered solutions that was on the left hand side of the columns that we saw earlier. So what's inside of it? Pretty much the same thing that we saw inside of a hyperconverged node. We were talking about we've got processor, RAM, cooling, network, optional GPUs, and either all flash or hybrid disks. The difference with VxRail is that instead of saying, hey, you know, we can just simply choose from any nodes we want, we've sort of got a subset of nodes that we can choose from, right? If you wanted a monster 8U box with, you know, eight, eight sockets in it, that's not an option here with VxRail because that's an engineered solution. The most that we can get, uh, admittedly, which is still a lot, is 48 terabytes per node. And we recently updated the architecture since it's moved over to powered servers from Quanta. So I think you can, the number of cores you can get is pretty high. You can get up to 44 cores in a node now with some of the bigger 2U appliances. And these are based off of the Power Edge series. And as we look at, you know, what's available inside of them, pretty much the same thing. We've got the Broadwell processors able to do up to 44 cores per node, memory, power, GPU storage networking. And there, this slide is just highlighting simply the differences between that 2U4 node uh, form factor versus the 1U one node form factor and 2U form factors that are provided with a storage dense VDI, which will typically have larger GPUs in them and other modes. 
So this is important to note is that we can also scan this, when we're talking about scale up or scale out, the idea here is that if you're going to scale up, that is filling in those empty disk spots that exist on your existing hosts and clusters, right? So if you need to expand, you could fill a disk. And to scale out is to say, hey, you know what? We're going to add nodes as we continue to scale out our solution. And that's, you know, going to be two different ways that you can scale that solution out. Again, with DXRL, we were talking about some of the constraints, right? With an engineered solution, there's constraints to uh, suffice with a reduced number of variables in a given solution. So we, in that, we see that all nodes in a cluster must run the same version of the XRL software. We know that the four cluster nodes, the first four cluster nodes must be identical for all flash configurations. So it's a 10 gig networking requirement that's dictated by VMware Virtual SAN. Um, all Pines clusters, models in a cluster don't necessarily need to match, but the first four do. Um, and then we can go three to 64 nodes in a cluster, uh, but only we can only do eight if we're not using 10 gig networking. And we, we're going to probably need an RPQ for stretch clusters, and if we've got clusters that go more than 32 nodes. A lot, you know, and this is, and this is true because I've sort of been with a VxRL product. My first experience with it was with 3.0, and I'm happy to say that, you know, since they've moved to 3.5 and to 4.0, that there has been a massive amount of improvements, um, and a lot of them has been correlated directly with implementations of vSphere and saying, hey, once vSphere came out and we had, you know, 6.0 U2, that, hey, we can get, you know, we can get more uh, features and functionality just out of software simply by upgrading. So starting at 3.5, we saw the increase of, you know, IOPS limits. Um, starting with DxRail 4.0, we have the implementation of a three-node option, whereas with 3.5, the four-node was the minimum configuration um, and, and things like that. When we talk about hyperconverged, though, the next thing that always comes up is like, cool, and I always ask this question of, you know, storage funders or anybody, that's great, we've got a storage solution. How do, I, how do I protect it? How do I replicate it? How do I back it up? How do I archive it? So, you know, tell me how I can ensure that I can recover from a disaster in one of my data centers. And with VxReal, you can really meet at pretty much any RPO or RTO. We can use uh, virtual SAN stretch clusters if we have synchronous write requirements. We can leverage either recover point for, v for virtual machine or vSphere replication to say, hey, if we've got point in time snapshots that we need to meet or have some sort of a consistency group, then we can leverage recover point for VM. Or if we've got sort of this idea where we just need to replicate it, we don't really care about keeping those VMs in sync, we can use these for replication. And then BDP is VMware Data Protection, which is sort of the backup and archival product, which is a function of VMware. Um, and looking at this, this was, uh, BDP was recently EOL'd. And looking into my crystal ball, if I had to guess without any sort of proprietary information, since VDP is based off of Avamar technology under the hood, and looking at um, the offering that is replacing it, there's sort of a transition path from BDP to Avamar. My guess is that Avamar will end up taking the place, but that's not based on any proprietary information. We can protect data locally with fault domains, leveraging VxRL. This is, again, a function of virtual SAN. We can locally back it up with BDP, and we can replicate it with recover point for virtual machine. And all of these require no additional hardware outside of VxRail. So the idea is if you leverage VxRail, the software that gets layered on top of it, that you can protect the virtual machines that exist amongst it with the BDP and Recover Point for VM products. From a disaster recovery standpoint, if we want to replicate and recover at a later location, we can say, hey, if we've got requirements for synchronous replication, uh, we, can, we can make that happen. And if we've got requirements for a very fast RTO, we can make that happen with stretch clusters as well. But one of the biggest upgrades that I am happy to say is, is dropped with 4.0 is that now if you're on VxRail 3.5, you can simply leverage a one-click upgrade. So you can download VxRail Software Manager from the VxRail Manager, which includes all the updates for the vCenter appliance, your ESXi, your VxRail Manager, your ESRS, and it will automatically perform readiness check perform a full upgrade, and then post-upgrade validation checks to ensure that everything went successfully. And all of that is done via the VxRail Manager UI, which is configured uh, as a part of implementation. Which, when we are looking at implementation, we're talking about a wizard-driven active environmental validation where we're saying, okay, we are basically entering our, you know, our time zone, we're entering Active Directory and all of our IP address information. We see like management, vMotion, virtual SAN, VM networks, 
other integrated solutions and validation, and then we can basically configure it from a bring up wizard. So it is a very, very simple stand up. So that is the quick overview on BX Rail. So that was one of the engineered solutions. So stepping into validated SDDC, this is taking the concept again, building with multiple duplos and going from there. So what is VMware Cloud Foundation? VMware Cloud Foundation at its core is a unified presentation of vSphere, vSAN, and NSX under a single automated manager which provides lifecycle management for all of those components. And this is available on-prem or as a service. And the idea here and the difference between the architecture of sort of focusing on nodes and clusters versus focusing on networks, nodes, and clusters is that you're thinking a little bit bigger picture when you're thinking with VMware Cloud Foundation. Because think of the, think of the product name, Cloud Foundation. The idea is you're trying to implement and deliver an experience that's similar to a software or as a hardware as a service provider where you're saying, hey, I want to have you know access to resources quick, 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 so that when I get nodes dropped in on the floor for a new project, that I can realize that value readily and quickly and not have to spend a ton of time on bring up. So if we look at what it provides, it automates the entire life cycle across the, pretty much the entire software infrastructure. So VMware Cloud Foundation has an SDDC manager, which assists with the deployment, configuration, provisioning, and upgraded patching of vCenter, ESX, NSX, and vSAN. And when we look at what it takes to actually do all of that independently outside of a, some sort of a manager, that that's sort of a big idea. And when we're looking at, you know, other nodes like we were sort of talking about, you know, if we're just leveraging vSAN sort of by itself or we're leveraging, you know, a VxRail, we're, we're still end up focusing on the side where we're like, all right, well, we've got vSphere and we've got, you know, some sort of a software-defined storage platform. We're pretty much focusing on the cluster level. With VMware Cloud Foundation, we've got the entrance of NSX, which is VMware Software-Defined Networking Product, which allows us to say, you know, we're, we're really more concerned with that rapid provisioning and consumption of the resources. And when we're talking about consuming the resources, sort of at the next level, that's where the vRealize suite comes in and says, hey, how can we programmatically consume our resources? So how, how is VMware Cloud Foundation even sold or implemented? Well, with qualified ready nodes from Dell Fidget 2 Quanta and HP, we can build a configuration that meets the hardware requirements. And using qualified networking from Cisco and Arista, we can build components and say, all right, this is, this is how we would like, to look, like it to look. And this can be assembled, you know, and imaged, you know, by the customer directly, you know, with help from Advisex or from VMware. And uh, that is sort of the, the, the idea there is that's the validated SDDC, which is ready, sort of ready to go. Um, it's ready to go, but you're still assembling it yourself. Um, and that, that's the difference between that and an engineered solution is with HIST, you have choices. When we look at integrated systems, like we'll talk about VxRack SDDC next, we'll see that that is sort of like, you know, that is a sort of managed engineered offering that is not based on software, it's based off of a, a turnkey solution. So with VMware VIA, we've got a, uh, the VMware Imaging Appliance, which basically aids in the bring up of Tor switches, the management switch, VMware and clusters, and it basically helps us prepare a rack physical bring up of the software. Along with the VIA, with VMware Cloud Foundation, we sort of have the, the heart and soul, which is the SDDC manager. And this is used, and you'll notice that this UI right here is, is pretty similar looking to the VxRail UI. And that's, and that's sort of on purpose. While VxRail and, uh, is not necessarily a supported component of VMware Cloud Foundation at this time, we'll notice that that's sort of the idea is that moving forward that you know, we're working with this abstraction of hardware and software components being managed here. Um, so with the SDDC manager, we can sort of abstract and aggregate resources into workload domains, which allows us to pick clusters from the pool of available nodes that we have in front of us. Um, and with that, we can sort of deploy and configure and manage physical resources. Uh, you know, we can actually see how many racks that we've got here. We've got one rack in this image, six hosts and five switches, right? And how many workload domains do we have here? We've got two workload domains. We can also see sort of a high level view of resource capacity. This is not to replace vCenter because this little, you know, pinwheel of saying, hey, how much CPU are we using 
is not going to replace, you know, understanding and troubleshooting CPU from a vSphere perspective. But we get a, bear, a broad picture of what kind of resources we're consuming across our infrastructure, which is sort of that 10,000 foot level view. And then also we can create and manage the workload domains from here. So any of those uh, clusters or workload domain bring us, we can do automatically from our SDDC manager. All right, so if we look at the workload domains that are, you know, provisioned in this image, right, we've got sort of the idea that we've got SDDC manager managing all of the data in these racks. And the idea here is that we've got one management switch here that's sort of the brains behind the bring up and provisioning operations for the network. And SDDC Manager works directly with vCenter to assist in the provisioning and bring up of hosts and other hosts for uh, workload domains. So <clears throat> as we look at the management, you know, the first four hosts are going to comprise the management, the management domain. We need to have something from an architectural perspective that is going to, you know, the question who watches the watcher. We've got a management domain that is a mandatory bring up for uh, VMware Cloud Foundation. So it's important to note that the first four nodes are going to be used for management with VCF. It's a very important take home. Um, <clears throat> and as we look at what components are potentially shared between them, so we've got this idea where we've got sort of this management workload domain set up right here. And for each domain that we would set up workload domains separately, we would set up its own vCenter server and NSX manager for each of those domains. However, there are some shared components that we would be leveraging inside the management domain. And those shared components are namely the SSO domain with the platform services controller. We would use centralized monitoring for vRealize operations manager and log insight. And they would also be using a dedicated vCenter, um, you know, particularly for the management of the management domain. So again, <clears throat> looking at the hardware switch that we've got here, this is uh, one of those, the, the model number, I think it's the Dell S3048. Uh, the idea here is that we've got sort of some software-defined smarts that is in this hardware management switch that is performing the bring up and network configuration for the entire network that is at top of rack here. So all of the network configuration is done from the SDDC manager rather than you know opening a session or plugging in a console cable directly into the switch and performing that configuration. And because we see uh, the SDDC manager performing the functions of network configuration, this is precisely why when we said we only have two qualified network offerings for top of rack, which is Cisco and Arista, that those that's, that goes along with being an engineered solution, right? Where we say, hey, we've, we've got less variables. And VMware plans to expand that number to others in the future, uh, but for now, those are the two that are supported. So if we look at the lifecycle manager and what is what does this actually do and perform from a function standpoint, what this allows us to do is it basically is going to, first of all, it's going to automatically notify us if there's some kind of an upgrade to any uh, portion of our platform. We can download and schedule updates and we can view and monitor and track the status. And so we can even schedule updates to happen in off hours. And that's, that's really very, very important to be able to do that. So what do we see at the manager actually, you know, it, uh, updating and managing? We see, as we talked about before, we saw it, you know, it manages vSphere, it manages VC, it manages NSX. But in addition to that, we can also manage Horizon platforms with virtual desktops and login site and other operations managers as well. And in the future, the idea here, guys, is the VMware Cloud Foundation is going to be managing life cycles and sort of providing that standardized, bundled versions of software components that fit together and saying, would you like to download that pack file and just update it all? So what kind of updates are there that are actually available? The idea here is that there's like update bundles which provide those hot fixes and patches, and those are your more frequent releases. That there's upgrade bundles which sort of you know follow the, that quarterly model where we're saying, hey, you know, once a quarter we've got new functionality we want to implement. Cool, yeah, we can update that. And then there's sort of the combination of upgrade update bundle, which is you know for the customers that have less movement in uh, versions that they've got out there. That is uh, ideal for them where it's it's going to be set and sort of knock it all out at once. So how does it actually look? It looks like this. Like, hey, inside of the FPDC manager, it's like, would you like to download some of those updates and go ahead and implement them? Yeah, sure, you can view the updates, you can download them, you can schedule the updates, and that can all be done in a non-disruptive process. So as we look at, you know, what functions of software are actually available today, 
so today we can patch and manage with VCF uh, 2.1, uh, vCenter 60U2 and vSAN 62, and these numbers will increase in the future as more time allows for validation and testing. So as you can see, VMware Cloud Foundation is built for today and for the future. It's, it's basically saying that if you want to stop being concerned with the layer that is further down from the applications, then VCF is a great complement to, uh, to your infrastructure, simply because it allows you to automatically perform ring up and management of workload domains across your infrastructure, allowing you to, to provision and think about your resources differently. You don't think about it in terms of this is a, this is a SQL server, this is one of my SQL server hosts, and he goes in my SQL server cluster. Now you think of it differently. You think of it like different blocks and different chunks of resource that you can allocate as you see necessary. Um, and that, that is done entirely in an automated fashion by VCF. So as we look at VxRack as the last function of hyperconverged infrastructure today, what we're going to see is that it is pretty similar to VMware Cloud Foundation. The reason for that being, it is powered by VMware Cloud Foundation. And the difference between VMware Cloud Foundation and leveraging VxRack SDDC is that VxRack SDDC is a fully integrated turnkey solution, meaning that networking is chosen. You're choosing, you know, the amounts of the CPUs and the sizes of disks and the type of disk that exists inside of your infrastructure, but that's pretty much it. You're not necessarily choosing, you know, uh, uh, node sizes or anything like that or additional components that are going to go into them. You're pretty much simply choosing how, you know, the the amount of resource you're going to require and uh, it's going to be pre-assembled and, and sent to you. So again, it is powered by VMware Cloud Foundation, so it allows for both, you know, standard on-prem public clouds, and we just talked about that at length. So <clears throat> when we're looking at the VxRack SDDC, you know, obviously there's uh, VMware Cloud Foundation that's a function of that. We can layer in the vRealize suite for vRealize automation and vRealize business, or we can leverage it for virtual desktops and sort of this idea of the Horizon Suite add-on, where we can say, hey, if we're looking at bundling in some of these functions, where if we sort of wanted to make a ready-built cloud or a ready-built presentation solution, that we can most definitely do that as a function of uh, VMware Cloud Foundation. <clears throat> and again, we see that we're leveraging the hardware management switch to do the, cons the, the discovery, the configuration, and the managing and monitoring of all of the components from a network perspective. And that is based off of a cumulus operating system uh, with uh, qualified hardware. So when we look at what physically comes with the VxRack SDDC, and this is one of the differences, right? With VMware Cloud Foundation, it's like, eh, go pick your own. Make sure that it's either, you know, one of our supported server vendors and, you know, one of the two supported networking vendors, but, you know, and that, that's going to build out in the future. With the VxRack SDDC, this is basically what ends up coming with. We get get the redundant power, we get the cabinet, we get, you know, a minimum of eight, right, and that's important because the first four for management, and we talked earlier that if we're leveraging vSAN, four is the minimum. So two four-node clusters from a minimum standpoint is eight, and we can do four to uh, 24 power edge hybrid or all flash, and again, that was those are those choices that we can make. We get the single management switch, which is running Cumulus software, and that's responsible for the management and configuration and monitoring of our redundant top of rack switches for the so uh, we would end up with um, you know two top of rack switches and then two spine switches to connect them so that we could scale out to a maximum of eight racks with the XRAC SDDC. So if looking at the base system, this is simply highlighting the components that are that are built in there. It's the VxRack SDDC is powered pretty much primarily at this point by the PowerEdge R630 server. It is a one U, one node server. And we can pretty much anything we can configure inside of that is flexible, but outside of that, it gets pretty static pretty quickly. So if we look inside there, we can have up to 18, uh, 18 cores in a single CPU. We can have half a terabyte of memory and two 10 gig uplinks um, with you know a maximum flash capacity of 15 terabytes per node. So really, when you're talking about it from a compute perspective, there's a lot of flexibility in what we can offer uh, in terms of what is physically going inside of that one node, one U box. And this is simply a breakdown of the differences in some of the memory, SSD cache, and, and hybrid capacities for those nodes, for the 1U1 node uh, choice that we have. So 
the idea here, again, is that partnering with sort of a standardized validated offering and with um, VMware Cloud Foundation, we can provide an infrastructure that we can scale up very, very quickly, that we can automate the bring up of servers, of networks, of cabinets even. And that is, that is incredibly powerful as you need to scale. And uh, this, is, this goes even further in saying as we need to scale out or up, uh, this is pretty much predominantly a scale up model, where when we decide we are going to be adding uh, resource to our clusters or to our workload domains, we are simply adding um, a node that is populated entirely. And again, these are available pretty much either in hybrid or offline systems. And this is simply highlighting, you know, that we've got that, that Dell management switch, Cisco Nexus switches, and the node configurations that exist, right? So there's the model numbers for the Cisco Tor switches. And the idea here is that, you know, with either VMware Cloud Foundation or VxRec SDDC, that we will be configuring a solution that will interoperate with your existing data center network. Um, so that's oftentimes the question is like, well, hey, well, how does the on-ramp look for this? Is it layer two? Is it layer three? Um, it, it can be layer two or layer three, but layer three is preferred from the standpoint of uh, routing is, is going to be a little bit better for trying to establish some sort of a leaf spine network uh, that is new to your rack scale infrastructure. And then from a logical network perspective, when we look at this, we say, okay, you know, we will be existing. We will be carving up networks. We want to be able to do that in an automated fashion where we're not asking a bunch of questions every single time we have to expand. So that is sort of how uh, the infrastructure ends up looking. And that is the end of the VxRack SDDC presentation. And I wanted to spend a quick minute just talking about, so, I mean, why, why Vizix? Why, why, why even you guys? Why, why does this matter? You know, the value that we bring isn't necessarily in saying this is a cool tech. The value is in our technologists and saying we can help you decide what's important for you uh, because we know how all of these technology solutions function. And at Advisex, we will never necessarily recommend that you purchase a solution that doesn't fit your requirements or is goes way above and beyond your requirements and has spend that you don't necessarily need to drop. So if we're looking again at, you know, someone that says, you know, I really want art, I really want someone that is going to, you know, see through selling a product and, and see what I'm trying to accomplish as a part of my job in IT, then you really want to work with the best of the best. You want to work with an artist, someone that has done it before, that experiences, that has deep experience and has tight connections with the partners that are leveraging software that you're working with. So if you're looking at us from a, you know, YS perspective, yeah, advising pretty much is one of the Bob Rosses of infrastructure consulting and saying, and our partners recognize this as well. In fact, we were recently awarded the, the 2016 Global Partner Innovation Award. So the, we were named one of the top VMware partners globally for our services division. And, you know, that's, that's CR, how to show our president right now with Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware right there. So, you know, Looking at, looking at what we can actually do, we have we have made serious investments in our technologists as a company to ensure that we can provide you guys with solutions based on our proven methodologies. Not to push a product or to say, hey, we would just love for you guys to acquire uh, this this one thing and then goodbye, have a nice day. The, the idea here is that we're com our, one of our core values is customers for life. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that you guys are not only happy with the solutions that you're acquiring, but that we can work with you through that and ensure that you're making a good business decision for yourselves. And again, our core partners are Dell EMC, HP, Oracle, Palo Alto, Microsoft, Cisco, and VMware. And we have different tiers of partnership with each of those. And this is just a slide that sort of demonstrates the breadth and availability of some of our customer base that we have out there. And so we've got about five minutes left. That's the end of the presentation that is scheduled for today. If you guys have questions and you would like to um, ask a couple questions, you guys can ask those questions either in the questions pane or in the chat pane down there. And I would be happy to answer any of those. So I'll just sort of monitor that in case there's uh, a couple questions.
All right, I got one question that's asking, um, what do you see most of the time? Do you end up seeing uh, people do the individually built solutions or the engineered solutions? And th the answer to that is uh, it absolutely depends. Customers that are more focused on cost are going to be like more likely to choose the build your own, simply because total cost of ownership is through the floor when you're willing to own more of the engineering of the solution and the management of the solution. Uh, cost is a little bit higher when you're in the engineered solution, but it also aids in the life cycle management. So, you know, it really depends what the requirement is. If it's for, uh, you know, managing a farm of, you know, several thousand hosts uh, with a staff of three, then I would probably not be recommending, you know, individually built <laughs> nodes. I'd probably be recommending as much automation as possible. If it's for a robo use case, I would probably be recommending, you know, whatever the lowest total cost of ownership is going to be, simply because robo is always looking at saying, how do we make sure that we protect our data while we are maintaining the existing um, low cost that is demanded of us in those remote sites? Good question, though. And I think that is it for the questions. Yep, I think that's it for the questions. So I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, Jackie, I can turn it back to you at this point. Great. Thank you, everybody, for attending. I did record this, so if you are interested in uh, receiving this um, in email, just contact Kate, and I will make sure that I get that over to her to um, send out to whoever would like to see this. Again, thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a wonderful weekend.